It's been three years since we've heard these readings. We hear them once every three years, and the last time we read them, I was just named your pastor, and we did a series on the Mass, and then we made some changes. And uh, wow, what a lot has happened in three years, huh? Incredible. I want to... I want to just take a moment and, and look at what's happened in the last three years because I think it's important. The liturgical cycle calls us to remind ourselves of God's mercy to us and the readings are always attached to particular graces. And I think there's a particular grace that's happened here in our community three years ago with these readings. We look and see what happened and, well, there's, there's several things that were not great. Some people left and that was a sadness and it continues to be a sadness. Some people left and a lot of new people came. That's the joy. We had a lot of new people and a lot of new faces, and so welcome to all of you who've come. We started perpetual adoration three years ago, and the graces keep pouring in. Lots of healings have been happening of marriages, families, individuals. It's incredible. It continues. We built a kitchen during the pandemic year. We've had a ton of marriages. We're on track to have probably about 40 marriages in the last three years, which is incredible <laughs> for a parish of our size. That's unbelievable. So that's an incredible grace. We've had several young men express interest in the priesthood, Praise God. We've had a couple of women who are interested in religious life, and one of them is entering the convent this fall. Thanks be to God. We're seeing incredible, tremendous things happening in our midst, brothers and sisters. We're also moving toward making a school a reality again. That's a little bit ways off, but God is bringing people to the table who have those talents, and I'm really excited about what the future holds for education with us again. And we're moving in the direction of making beautiful, sacred music, which uh, we still need more help, as you can see, because we didn't have a choir today. So we need more people who are willing to step up so we can have enough people in the rotation so it's not exhausting for people uh, to do the music ministry. We want to be able to have something every weekend. So we need more of you. And I apologize if you've said you're interested and we haven't followed up with you. Please keep telling us because we're not organized. I wish we were, okay? I wish we were, we're trying to get there, but please uh, continue to bother us, okay? If you have gifts, bother us, okay? Because if you tell me, it's gonna fall through the sieve of my mind, okay? All right, I, I'm just telling you, please continue to bother us. If you have gifts and you want to use them, uh, please. We will eventually get to you. Uh, please continue to talk to us. So anyway, uh, liturgy is our life, and as we've been making more beautiful adjustments in the sanctuary, we also, the altar used to be here, and of course we moved it here underneath the baldacchino, which is the, the high point of the sanctuary to show that Jesus is the center of our lives. And when we make Jesus the center of our lives, it reorders everything else. Things are unstable for a little bit, they're a little bit chaotic, but then as the dust settles, we realize the fruitfulness that's been happening there. So I hope in these next few weeks, we're going to go through a series on the Mass again to see what's happened. And plus, we have a lot of new people who didn't hear it the first time. And so I hope that if you've been having questions about why we do certain things that we do, we can get those answered. And I hope it to be a little interactive so that in the weeks to come, you can submit your questions to us. We're going to send out a flock note. If you have questions about the Mass, send them in, and we'll try and address them during this series. Sound good? Okay, today we're going to talk about... Um, uh, the entrance of the Mass all the way up through the Liturgy of the Word, and we're going to do a little show and tell, but first we have to deal with the readings. Okay. What, the reason why we look at anything that we're doing in the Mass is because we understand Jesus to be a particular person, a divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He's not just a prophet. Now, we look at the Old Testament, and this is really remarkable. We have to understand why the Jews were so excited about this miracle, right? Elisha, the prophet, he is the, di the disciple of Elijah, who is the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. And Elijah had the greatest spirit of God come upon him, and Elisha asked for a double portion, and he got it. So he is the most powerful prophet in the Old Testament, he and Moses, right? That's why they appear with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, right? The two greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Elisha is one of them. He raised people from the dead, Okay, Elisha is a pretty cool dude, and in this miracle that he does, he gets, five bar he gets 20 barley loaves, and he feeds 100 people. And I thought, well, 20 loaves, that's five a loaf. I mean, he could do that, right? I mean, <laughs> how small is that loaf, really? Well, it's a small loaf, and so it's basically saying each person would get a bite, you know, maybe. But he's saying, no, feed it to the people. This is not an insulting meal. God's going to not just give enough, but a little bit left over. And indeed, that happens. But he says, thus says the Lord, this will happen. Okay, and it happens. A little bit is left over and enough is fed to 100 people to satisfy them. Now we come to the gospel. What does Jesus do? How many loaves does he have? Five. So he has a quarter of the resources. How many people are there? 5,000. So he's got 50 times the people and a quarter of the resources. Right? And not only they add this detail, as much of, he has two fish, so even less. And it says that the 5,000 people had as much of the fish as they wanted. You get that? 
If you thought Elijah was great, if you thought the anointing on Elisha was great, boy, the anointing on this guy is off the charts. There's something different about him. He's not just a prophet. And they say, wow, this is the prophet. And Jesus is like, they don't get it. So he runs off for another day to give the rest of the homily about what's really happening. Okay, So we have to recognize, okay, who is this Jesus? And what is the purpose of this miracle? The church fathers always saw this miracle as a sign of the Eucharist. Because Peter and Andrew, they say, hey, there's five loaves and two fish. What good is all this stuff for so many? This is not, this is not going to satisfy us. And God takes what is ordinary and insignificant and makes it super abundant. How much is left over? Twelve baskets. It's not just a little bit left over. It's so abundant they can't possibly eat it all. And that's looking forward to the Eucharist where we take insignificant host. It's not the most high quality bread in the world. Okay? It's not a, a, a nice uh, Sauvignon Blanc. You know, wine. It's, it's not like this really high quality wine. God takes these ordinary you know, middle of the road, blue collar stuff and makes it into the banquet of heavenly abundance. And if he can do that with ordinary bread and wine, what can he do for you? What can he do to your life? That's the Catholic faith. And so that's why we're going to dive into the mass to see how rich it is and how it really can change your and my life and how it's already changed our lives here in the parish. But first, let's do a little show and tell. I'm going to, uh, just a second. Welcome to Nordstrom's. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to talk first about the vestments of the priest because uh, this is something that's really important. We recognize that every Mass, it is not the priest who celebrates the Mass. It is who? Jesus Christ. And so all of the clothing of the priest is meant to remind him that it is not he, it's not his personality, it's not his gifts that make this happen. I cannot change bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus without the power of Christ working in me. I could never do that on my own. And so I need to not get a big head and think that because I'm such a great person, somehow this can happen. No, not at all. Without Christ, this is impossible. So we, we are reminded that what is the first thing a priest does when he puts on in the day? is the cassock, okay? Now, you can also wear, uh, as you see I do um, during the week, the, the regular collared shirt and, and pants. That's more of an American Anglican invention, right? But the traditional garb of the priest for centuries was the cassock. Why? The cassock is a reminder of the person of Jesus. So a traditional cassock has 33 buttons. Why do you think that is? How many years did Jesus live? Uh-huh, 33, right? So he buttons each of the years of the life saying, I'm putting on Jesus Christ. It's black, meaning I have died to the world. My life is no longer mine. It is Christ who lives in me. Oftentimes on the sleeves, um, I got it on this one, not on this one. Uh, traditionally, you'd have five buttons for the five wounds of Christ, right? And then you have the white collar, which is the sweet yoke of Jesus. It's the one thing that's white, Okay. So it's a recognition that it is Christ who shines forth with the brilliance of his light, okay? So that's the first thing a priest does that he wears for the day. And then when he's dressing for mass, it's a second layer of Jesus Christ. Because as you notice, the servers and I are dressed differently when we're in the sanctuary. And in fact, the readers and those who are coming up should be dressed differently because we're entering into this place which is symbolic of heaven. They're dressed up in a cassock and a surplice to remind you that they're no longer who they are in the world, they are taking on the role of angels to serve around the altar, to serve Jesus Christ in the person of the priest. All right? So what does the priest do first when he's getting dressed? He puts on, this is an optional piece, but I, I wear it and I'll tell you why. Okay, it's called the amice, which is basically, it's a square piece of cloth with two ropes onto it, and then it is tied around the head. It's a spiritual helmet. The priest prays a prayer for spiritual protection because here's the deal, friends. Do you think that Satan likes what the priest is doing right now? Not at all, because what is he offering? He's offering the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ that destroyed the power of darkness. Do you think he's going to try and distract the priest? Better believe it. Plus, this priest is easily distracted, okay? <laughs> True story. Okay, so the fact of the matter is, is that the priest is praying against distraction and against temptation so that he's able to focus and give himself on the altar, right? Now, uh, you don't have to wear it, but it's like not wearing a helmet when you're riding a bike. Can you? Sure. Is it a good idea? Not so much, right? So the fact of the matter is, I tell you children, wear a helmet. Priests, wear a helmet, okay? You're going into battle, okay? Don't be dumb. Anyway, sorry. Side note, okay. 
So anyway, that's the first piece of clothing that goes on. It also is to cover the street clothing. Because again, when the priest is up here, the only thing you see should be Jesus Christ, not the way he is in the world. Okay, so that's the first piece. The second piece he puts on is the alb. Okay, a couple different designs of alb. One has completely enclosed neck. And so if you have one like that, you don't need an amice because it covers the street clothing. And a lot of priests have this kind of style. The other one is an open square neck and you definitely need the amice to cover your street clothing. It's just stylistic difference, that's it. No, no real thing. But the alb is simply from the Latin word albus, which means white, okay? And so it's a white garment. It's a reminder of baptismal dignity. Before I'm a priest, I am a baptized Christian. Okay, so this is the very first thing. With you, I am a Christian. For you, I am a priest. Okay, so I have to remember that this is my principal dignity, that Christ saved me from darkness and death. And so I put that on to remind myself that it's my baptismal priesthood first, and then I receive the ministerial priesthood that will be put on later. Okay, after that then is the cincture. Okay, this is really cool. Watch this. Whoop. <laughs> Sorry, priests are nerds. I don't know. Anyway, so the, what is the cincture? The cincture is a sign of chastity, okay? So the priest is praying a prayer to remain chaste, to be faithful to the promises that he's made. We realize that priests have made a tremendous promise to be celibate and continent for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, to imitate Jesus most perfectly as he was celibate and chaste his whole life. We realize when priests do not live up to this promise, it is devastating. We've seen that on the news even this week of a high profile priest that was, his sins were exposed to the world and we're so scandalized whenever we see it happen, we have to recognize people that we need to pray for our priests. And the fact is that we know that the corruption of the best is the worst. That's why we're so discouraged when we see that happen because we know they're called to be an angel and they're acting like demons. And so we need to pray for them. We need to pray for this priest in a particular way because he's probably just humiliated beyond belief. We pray this is an opportunity for conversion for him and for all priests that have been thus exposed. And for those who haven't been exposed, they would repent before it's too late because guess what's gonna happen in the end? Guess what? All of you guys' YouTube histories are gonna be exposed. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Everything you've ever seen, everything you have ever said and done will be laid bare before the eyes of everyone. And that's not just for those people who are wicked, it's for everybody. That's what we call the final judgment. And so this is a reminder to the priest to say, be faithful, you must be pure of heart as Jesus is. Okay? Whew, we're not even dressed yet. You see how incredible this is? <laughs> right? Our faith is so deep. Everything means something. Okay? Then we come to uh, the next piece, which is the stole. Okay? The stole is the sign of priestly authority, okay? So this is the sign that I'm a priest. Deacons will wear it differently, as will sometimes bishops in the traditional rite. So uh, it's worn straight down like this as a sign of priestly authority. Deacons wear it to the side, showing that they have a, a there's three categories of holy orders, right? The bishop, then the priest, and then the deacon, right? So the, the deacon has the lowest grade, okay? So this is a sign that the, you have the authority of the priesthood of Jesus Christ, okay? And then lastly, is the chasuble, okay? The chasuble is the sign of Christ's love. So love goes on last because love covers everything. So which is why it's kind of weird when sometimes we saw this fad in the 70s and 80s where the stole was on the outside of the chasuble and we thought that was cool. It's not cool because it's a sign of abuse of power. Because <clears throat> saying love isn't the thing you're gonna see first, it's the fact that I'm a priest. Better bow down, huh? Mm, interesting, right? Symbols mean something. Be careful, don't change the symbol if you don't know what it means, right? But anyway, there's a couple different, you'll notice this is a different design than the one I'm wearing. There are two different, these are two different designs. This is called a Gothic vestment. A Gothic, of course, coming from kind of France, Northern Europe. Uh, it makes sense because it's a lot more fabric. If you're in a stone cathedral in the winter, is it cold? You better believe it, <laughs> okay? So more fabric, uh, colder climates makes more sense. This is called a fiddleback or a Roman vestment. Where was this developed? in the south, in the Mediterranean. Is it hotter there? Better believe it. So there's less fabric. Your arms move more freely, more breathability, and so it makes more sense. So they're just stylistic differences. There's no theological like, ooh, somebody wears that, so there's something weird about them. No, it's just simply two different styles that developed over centuries, okay? So I wear both of them. Uh, this one was a gift from my home parish, Our Lady of Lourdes, so it's got some uh, beautiful kind of symbolism about that. And then this one was a gift from my parents. And so what's beautiful about this is that Whenever I'm getting vested, I'm remembering that I come from a tradition. I come from a place that was praying for me since I was born. 
I'm remembering whenever I wear these vestments that there was a group of grandmas who were praying the rosary for vocations, and I am the fruit of their prayers. Right? And my parents, I'm the fruit of their love for one another, and I'm the fruit of their prayers for me too, and their witness of Christian life. Today really is, is a side note, I wish I could talk about this more, but uh, this is the first uh, time in the church's uh, calendar that we're celebrating Grandparents' Day. Pope Francis have instituted this last Sunday of July as Grandparents' Day, right? And so all of you grandparents, I say, God love you and bless you. I have a special prayer for you. Grandparents are the guardians of memory and of tradition. And it's really important that you hand it on because our world is forgetting its memory. And when we forget where we've come from, then we can be controlled and manipulated. And you're seeing that happen, don't you? So grandparents, your role is to remind people of our history, of our memory. Because if we lose that, we lose everything and we will be controlled and dominated by the wicked. Okay? So, side note, other homily for another day. <clears throat> and I forgot one last piece. Is this little thing you'll notice on my, my wrist here? This is an optional piece as well. It's called the maniple. It used to be required. It's no longer required. Some priests wear them. Some don't. Here's why I wear it. Because the maniple, what is it for? Well, it's basically a fancy handkerchief. Okay? Because in the early church when priests were celebrating mass... They had a lot more devotion than we do, and they would often weep during the whole Mass. So this was to wipe away their tears. Also, in hot climates, uh, it's nice to have a sweat rag. <laughs> right? So practical as well as spiritual. And, and during the, the centuries as it developed, it took on a spiritual significance as well. It symbolized the sweat and the tears of the people of God. So every morning when I put it on to celebrate Mass, I'm tying you and your needs and your preoccupations and carrying them with me to the altar kind of cool right so it's a good everything the priest does everything he it should remind him of his vocation who he is and what he's called to do for you so he's not celebrating the mass for himself he's celebrating it for you as the second vatican council says no one has any authority to change any part of the sacred liturgy on their own authority because it's not mine it is Jesus Christ and his church, and they hand it on for us. It's part of the deposit of faith. And so if you wonder what I'm about, the good thing about me is you don't have to wonder what I'm about. I tell you, I'm about obedience to the church. That is what I'm about. So if you want me to innovate and do something new and unheard of, that's what we call heresy. Not going to happen, okay? Everything that I'm doing is going to be based in our tradition, okay? And if it isn't, then call me on it, and I'll show you where it is in a document. And if I can't, then I'll change. That's where I'm at because I don't want to be disobedient because disobedience is what Satan does. If you or me say, you know what, I am a Catholic, but I don't agree with this thing that the church teaches. Pfft, that's what we call Protestantism. Sorry. <laughs> or something worse, right? Friends, we have to recognize that we are either disciples of Jesus Christ or we worship ourselves. And if you're going to make up your own religion, have fun. <laughs> you got to save yourself. We're here to worship the living God, not a God of our own mind or our own imagination, right? So everything the priest does is to remind him, this is not my ministry. This is not my parish. It was given to me by the bishop for a time, but I operate here in his name and the authority of the church that's given to me for a particular purpose, which is to teach, govern, and sanctify this parish community with the authority and the teaching of Christ and not my own words. Because if I'm using my own words, it's bad. Okay, all right. Show and tell. One last show and tell, and then we will do the very, just the very first part of the Mass. Okay. You may not have seen this all the time. Uh, we're starting to use it more now. This is the chalice, of course, and it's covered by a few things. This is called the burse, which is like a purse with a B. <laughs> okay. And what it does, it holds the corporal, which is a little rectangular uh, square cloth that is from the Latin corpus, which means body. So anything that is on the corporal is consecrated. Okay? So that's, the priest has to intend to consecrate things. So it's not like as soon as he says the prayer, any bread in the building becomes the body of Christ. Right? Not how it works. He has to intend to consecrate things. And so the corporal is a nice focal point that I say anything on this rectangular square is what I'm intending to consecrate. Okay? So that's the idea. So that goes on top. Then there is the veil. Now, why do we use a veil? What is the purpose of veils? Veils are to remind us that whatever is underneath this veil is holy. And we should approach it with care and with reverence. You notice we veil the most holy things. We veil the tabernacle because there, underneath the veil, 
is the Lord. We veil the chalice because this is the cup that will hold the blood of the new covenant. It is set aside for this purpose. We also veil brides. What does that say about you women and your dignity? Do you think the church doesn't respect your dignity? You are mistaken. <laughs> Do you think the veil is oppression? No, it is not. Some of you women have chosen to wear veils and it's beautiful. It's part of our tradition. Why? Because it's a reminder to men that you are sacred and you are not to be violated. You are a temple of God. You have equal and in fact even greater dignity than the men here. Do you realize that? Do you know we give more honor to this lady than we do any of the other saints? Why is that? Because women are better. <laughs> they are. They were made last, which means they're the crown of creation. Right? We have, we, men and women, right? We have to recognize this. We have different, we, we are different, but we, 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 we need to respond to God in the way that we're made. The church is feminine in our understanding. That's why the priesthood is masculine. There is a nuptial dynamic. Christ himself came to offer himself for the bride, who is the church. That's why priests are men. And the sanctuary is feminine. When the, when the priest goes in to the tabernacle, Right? When he go, pierces through the veil, this is a nuptial image. Whew. Friends, meditate on that for a little bit for your holy hour. It'll change your life. Right? You think the church is really stuck up and stodgy and dry and empty? Talk to any religious woman in the Carmelites. Right? Talk to any religious woman who is a cloistered woman, and they will tell you of their intimate, radical love, spousal love for Jesus Christ. And that's what the relationship is with Christ in each of the souls that are a part of his body. So when we unveil the chalice, then it's the second part of the mass. And so we're entering into the new covenant, right? So that's exciting, right? And we see, uh, there's, I want to just point out a couple of things. The pall goes on top. The pall is like a funeral pall. It covers the body. It's right over the host, which will become the body of Christ on the paten, okay? Then the purificator, uh, which does what it says, purifies things, okay? It's a little sacred napkin okay and then we come to the chalice now this chalice was a gift from my parents also for my ordination and I got it for a particular reason because it proclaims a story I don't get to tell the story very often um, but uh, there are three people on the bottom of the chalice the three characters King David Moses and Melchizedek these are three Old Testament priests prophets and kings okay so if you did your Bible study with me you know who they are um, and then as you travel up the chalice, you come to the angels, and then you come to the, the cup, which has three scenes on it. One is the trial of Jesus, the other is the scourging, and then lastly, the crucifixion, which is the reference point with the cross. So you move from the Old Testament typology to the New Testament fulfillment in Christ Jesus, of whose blood I will be drinking, right? So it's a reminder to the priest, if I get distracted very easily, which I do, <laughs> remember what you're doing. Remember who you are called to imitate. When you are celebrating this Mass, you are dying and rising. And I also put the rings of my grandparents on this chalice. So every time I celebrate the Mass, I'm carrying my grandparents with me and reminding of where I came from and that I'm part of a legacy of faith so grandparents realize your profound impact on your kids and your grandkids. Be a part of their lives. They need you. I need you, right? We all need you. So you're not unimportant, right? Does that help? Okay, good. Enough show and tell for this week. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about just the beginning of Mass, and then I'm getting too hot, and so we will uh, go on with Mass. Okay. When does Mass start? Sign of the cross? No, the procession. Bell rings. Ding, we all stand. What is the bell? The bell is the sound of the angel crying out, the bridegroom comes. The book of Revelation is open now, and we're going to see in symbolic representation what is happening in heaven right now, when Christ comes to judge the living and the dead. So we see a reenactment of the last judgment Right? And, in fact, the entirety of salvation history, the life of Jesus, and your life. The Mass is a profound mystery that we can never plumb the depths of. You can spend an eternity meditating on the Mass, and you will never get to the end of it. Okay? So the, the bell is the angel voice that said, we all rise, because when the 
angel calls us home, no one will be able to resist it. We will all have to stand up and give account for our lives and what we have done for good or for evil. And then Christ comes in triumphal procession, leading a whole host of captives with him. It is the ascension. He enters into the sanctuary carrying blood that is not of bulls and goats, but his own blood, entering into the sanctuary, into the Holy of Holies, presenting to the Father the spotless offering that redeems humanity, and then he kisses the altar. What's in the altar? Relic stone. That's right. Some of you were here at the relic tour. You know, in every consecrated altar, there is a stone that has the bones of a saint. I don't know what this one is. I wish they would have kept better records. We don't know. It is some early martyr, most likely. But in any case, why does the priest do that? Because he is greeting the saints in heaven. It is a reminder as he kisses the saints, it is a kiss of peace. Reminder to us that heaven and earth come together at the mass. This church is full right now. Not with you all, but with the saints and with the angels who are crying out ceaselessly, holy, holy, holy. Right? So this church is full right now. No social distancing. <laughs> Impossible, right? Right? Because every saint and angel is here wherever Jesus is present. Beautiful, huh? So it's a reminder to us the church in heaven, the church in purgatory, the church on earth are all bound together in one bond of love, okay, at every single mass. That's why I say at every funeral, remember, if you miss your loved ones, the farthest away they are is the next mass. Because wherever Jesus is, there is his body. Beautiful. We can talk more about that, but we can't. We go on, the priest then begins with the sign of the cross, but we already began, right? So some priests say, we began in the name of the Father. No, we already began. <laughs> we already began. We're already in it. We are in it, okay? We're reminded of the cross in which we were sealed and saved, and then we repent of our sins. Now, the penitential rite, when we take a moment to recall our sins, that is not confession, okay? So we have to be really clear about that. The, the prayer, the priest says, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and raise everlasting life, is not the same as absolution and confession. Some people think, oh, I did my confession at Mass. I don't need to go to confession. Eh. Sorry. At the Mass, venial sins are forgiven. Venial sins, but not mortal sins. Mortal sins require the confessional. Does that make sense? Everybody remember this? Good. Your catechism. Basic catechism. Mortal sins require the confessional. That's the means Christ has given us to be forgiven of intentional, serious sin. We must go there first before we can receive Holy Communion. But if you have committed minor faults, minor offenses, you are sorry for them, you repent of them at Mass, they are forgiven in the absolution at the penitential rite, or when you receive Holy Communion, or when you make the sign of the cross with holy water, or when you kiss a sacramental, right? There are many things that can re re remit venial sin, okay? Then we sing the Gloria, and the Gloria is the song of the angels at Christmas! What does that mean, that we sing it every Sunday? Every Sunday is Christmas! Isn't that great? Christmas is, uh, by the way, uh, less than six months away, okay? You don't have to wait for Christmas, it's right now! Why? Because he's right here. He comes to us at Christmas, and he comes to us at every Mass. Every Mass is Christmas. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He's here! Huh. If we knew this, if we just believed it, our lives would change, our world would change. We would not be afraid to tell everybody about it. Christ is here. They're looking for him. They're desperate. They're starving. And you can tell them, hey, he's over next door at the church here. Want to come to adoration? Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. It's every single Mass, not just Christmas. <laughs> Our faith is so amazing, brothers and sisters. It's so great. It'll change your life. And then the priest says, let us pray. And at that moment, you are supposed to pray. <laughs> You're supposed to lift up everything you've brought with you, all your preoccupations, all your worries, everything that you want. Give it to the Lord. And then the priest, on your behalf, prays the prayer of the whole church that every, every Catholic parish is praying in the world together, crying out to the Father. Sound good? All right, now we come to Liturgy of the Word, which we will cover next week. All right, so if you have any questions or anything that you want to know, uh, please uh, submit it to us over this next week, and we'll try and address it in these next four weeks as we go through John 6.